All right, welcome back to the channel. My name is Zach, and today is Teaching Tuesday as we continue our series on the book of Jude. Today we're going to look at verse 8 specifically, but before we get started, we're going to read verses 8 through 13 as we're going to look at these verses over the next six weeks. Stay tuned. already watched our videos on the first seven verses of the book of Jude, be sure to check those out right here before you continue watching this video. All right, let's read Jude 8 to 13. Yet in the same way, these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the era of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. So oftentimes when I'm looking at, you know, false teachers in this specific context of the book of Jude, I often think of political terrorists in the sense that they're similar in nature. You know, political terrorists, they work undercover, they work behind the scenes trying to orchestrate an attack against a country or an organization or against a person. And they do this undercover and they keep their plan under wraps until it all happens, right? And so I think it's very similar in nature to false teachers. You know, they are working behind the scenes, sometimes willingly, but albeit unwittingly. And so I think in the same way that, you know, a uh, freedom-loving nation wants to, you know, fight ideological terrorists, you know, it's infinitely more crucial for believers to want to fight off and ward off false teachers from the church because they spread lies and they spread deceit and all these different things that are damning to the souls of, of God's people. So believers must do everything to expose and reject these spiritual terrorists. You see, political terrorists, they typically, you know, inflict physical damage and external damage and material damage. But apostates disguised as genuine teachers can subvert God's truth and cause there to be lies to be spread of, among God's people that can be very damning. Believers must do everything to reject and to expose false teachers. And they do this in such an enticing way. And so they like to tickle the ears of their hearers so that they believe whatever they say. And they say that what their hearers want to hear. And so, you know, we are all sinful. But as Christians, we must be passionate about exposing error and rejecting error in the church. We must seek to preserve the purity of God's church and the loftiness of God's word. And so we must do everything to fight against these enemies of the truth. And Jude realized this immense danger that the apostates posed to divine truth. And that's why he exhorted his readers to contend for the faith and to keep battling for the pure doctrine of our common salvation against those who would undermine the gospel. But ultimately, these false teachers, they crept in unnoticed, as we saw in verse 4. And so because of that, the challenge was in trying to recognize these false teachers and to expose them before they brought harm on the church. So with that in view, this passage that I just read, it, it seeks to continue to depict the true face of the apostates. You know, Jesus pronounced woe and curses against the Pharisees, saying that they were like whitewashed tombs but on the outside, but on the inside they were like dead men's bones. And so that's kind of like what the apostates are. You know, they, they look like they're, they have everything together on the outside. They're, they're wearing this mask of, of genuine Christianity, but really they're false teachers and they're living in wickedness and sin and they want what's worse for God's people. And so we must do everything to expose them and to reject their, their lies so as to not harm the church. And because the apostates of Jude's time were so ungodly and spiritually dangerous, he used whatever language possible, the strongest language possible, to condemn them so as to describe their, their ungodly actions. So by doing this, Jude does several different things. He, he presents three characteristics of the apostate's nature, and he does three correlations to past apostates, and then he makes five comparisons to natural phenomena. And we're going to look at all of these over the next several videos as we go through verses 8 through 13. 
So let's read verse 8 again. Yet in the same way these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. So let's look at that. So by saying in the same way, Jude is further unlocking the significance of what he previously described in the last seven verses. The apostates typically exhibited ungodly character like the, the apostate Israelites, the apostate angels, and apostate Gentiles like Sodom and Gomorrah. And when Jude says by dreaming, he's talking about how that these the wicked behavior of these men was often derived from their dreaming. And Jude uses this term to describe that these apostates were phony visionaries. So to describe this kind of dreaming, Jude uses a word that's only used one other time in the New Testament, and that's in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 17 during Peter's sermon that he preaches at Pentecost. So in that passage, Peter preaches, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So Joel's prophecy and its affirmation in Peter's sermon, it may point to revelatory dreams and not necessarily, you know, uh, normal dreams that people have. And false teachers oftentimes claim their dreams as being authoritative and ultimately as a divine source to reveal their new truths, but really it's just lies and distortions. And by making such claims, apostates are saying that their counterfeit authority is above God's scriptural authority. And they substitute their own counterfeit authority for God's authority. And dreaming here also surely includes the apostates' perverted and evil imaginations. They reject the Word of God, and they're basing their deceptive teachings on the misguided musings of their own deluded and demonized minds. In the Old Testament, the term dreamer was synonymous with being a false prophet. Moses even warned about this and when he said, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him, and you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God who brought you from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. And along the same lines, the Apostle Paul cautioned, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause because by, by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. So we see here from the text that Jude identifies these false apostates as dreamers, and because of that, he gives them three characteristics of their nature, their immorality, their insubordination, and their irreverence. So Jude says these false teachers defile the flesh. In this instance, the word flesh here, it's the, the Greek word sarx, and that typically refers to, you know, the depravity of man, but in this instance, it refers to the physical body. And if Jude intended to refer to their depravity, he would have used the Greek word sarkinos, as Paul did in Romans 7, 14. And the word translated defile here is from a verb that means to dye or to stain something, whether that be clothing or glass. And in addition, it can also mean to pollute, to contaminate, to soil, or to corrupt. When that word defile is linked with the Greek word sarx for flesh, it's a reference to the moral and physical defilement of that person in question, i.e. sexual sin. Apostate teachers are inevitably immoral, even if that immorality is not seen by the people that they stand in front of or are amongst every day. After all, they have no ability to restrain their lusts, and they are generally characterized as those who live in the passion of their lusts because they do not know who God is. Later in this letter, Jude's going to say that these false teachers are devoid of the Spirit, and that's evidence 
in their abandonment of the truth. So thus they have no divine power to control their sinful impulses. And instead they are left to indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires. And ultimately in time, the truth about their immorality will inevitably emerge and people will find out about it. And Jude also writes that these false teachers reject authority. And because these apostate teachers love their immorality, it makes sense that they reject authority. Because if Jesus is meant to be Lord of our lives, he's not only the Savior of our, of our souls, he saved us at Calvary by dying in our place on the cross. He's also the Lord of our lives. So we must live after his commands and love those commands because of what he has done for us, because of the kindness he has showed us in giving us repentance. We must live in accordance to God's word and obey it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so because we have the Holy Spirit as Christians, we are able to actually obey the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is Lord and Savior. And the word reject here is from a verb that refers to destroying something that's already been established, such as an existing authority. And the word rendered authority, kuriotes, is related to the more familiar term kurios, which, which means Lord. And because these apostate teachers desire to rule their own lives, they reject the authority of Christ as Lord over them and, and submitting to his authority over their lives. And in reality, they're just like the scribes and the Pharisees that, that Jesus condemns in Matthew 23 when he says, You are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And Jude also said that these false teachers revile angelic majesties. Revile here is from the Greek word blasphemeo, is, which what, is what the word we get blasphemy from. And that ultimately means to slander or to speak evil of, and especially in the context of you know, to speak profanely against something sacred, and in this instance, God himself. So the false teachers were not just irreverent in some sense. They were outright blasphemers, and specifically of angelic majesties. So in light of the parallel passage in 2 Peter 2.10, this word angelic majesties, which translated from the Greek word doxa, is, is used to basically use angels as the object of their, of, of their blasphemy. Because throughout redemptive history, angels are considered to be holy, and they are, they are devoted to God's holy glory. And ultimately, they had a special role in establishing God's moral order. So for instance, God gave angels the ministry of helping communicate his law. And the holy angels will also be involved in the ultimate judgment of the wicked. We see, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So ultimately, by their lawless immorality and insubordination, the apostate teachers didn't only blaspheme God's holy angels, they also blasphemed God himself. All right, I think that's a great stopping point. We're going to continue looking at the book of Jude next week as we look at Jude 9. So be sure to join us then as we continue breaking it down verse by verse. If you found this video to be helpful, be sure to like it and share it with others so that they can learn more about the book of Jude as well. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit that red subscribe button and then hit the bell notification so you'll be notified by email whenever a new video is posted. And if you'd like to follow me on Instagram or Twitter, the handles are right here at ZachCampbell418. And if you'd like to support us in more tangible ways, we have new SDG merch. We have t-shirts, we have mugs, we have totes, and we have hoodies. And right now, the design on it is Theological Terms Thursday. It's a word cloud of all the words we've used from March 2019 to March 2020. So pick yours up today at the link in the description as well as the info card. And you can use these not only as your tangible support of, of us and of the channel, but also use these to start great gospel conversations with people. They're great ways to encourage people to say, hey, what's that shirt about? Hey, what, what is that word right there? It says aseity. What is that about? Or, you know, what, what does Soli Deo Gloria mean? What is that about? So you can use these shirts as ways to start conversations with people that will ultimately lead to sharing the gospel with them. So get yours today. This is the SDG by ZAC. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. With Teaching Tuesday on the book of Jude. Join us next time as we look at verse 9. I wish you providential blessings. Take care. We'll catch you next time.